Hey guys, it's Garen. Before we jump in, I wanted to let you know about another little project that we have. Uh, a lot of our audience is coming from a Christian perspective. And whether that's you or not, uh, you may be interested in trying to get a better understanding of what the Bible says and teaches. We have a lot of American filters that the Bible has been passed through. As it's been read and understood for so long in the American context, we can lose sight of what it actually meant to the original audience. And so that's something we're trying to recover and explore. So we started a new podcast called Bible Words, where we look at different biblical terms like justice, the nations, or even how the Bible addresses slavery. The episodes are short, and the first couple are already live, so you can check out Bible Words wherever you listen to podcasts. I don't know what most white people in this country feel, but I can only include what they feel from the state of their institution. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome to Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts, Katina and Garen. Today's topic is Maria Stewart. She's the first known American woman to speak to a mixed audience of white and black men and women. We talk about her early childhood experiences, some of the losses that she then experienced. We read several excerpts from various writings over her years. We talk about her move from Boston to New York, and then we talk about her legacy. It was great learning about Maria. She had influences on people like Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, and even Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Okay, today we are talking about Maria Stewart, uh, is what Garen told me. And I have, I have honestly no idea who she is, and, and I would probably... Uh, be comfortable assuming that a w- huge swath of our audience has no- has never heard of her, which is uh, probably going to be sad by the time I hear all this. But who is she? Who is Maria Stewart? Uh, why should we know who she is, who she was? And yeah, interested to hear more about her. So learning a biography can be a window into another period of history that for me is a lot more interesting than just reading a textbook about history. And Maria Stewart we can look at her life as a way to understand the world as it was in the 1800s. And she went on to do some great things. We're going to talk about that, but I'm going to save the plot twist. Okay. So she was born in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, She was born free in Connecticut in 1803. And she was orphaned by the age of five. So grew up without her parents. She was bound out as an indentured servant to a clergyman until the age of 15. And during that time, he had an extensive library. So she taught herself how to read. Hmm. I and mean, think of wow. just not having schooling and education, but just having a giant room of books and just figuring it out. Wow. Intelligent and industrious. Genius. She then moved to Boston and supported herself as a domestic worker there was not a lot of economic opportunity for a black woman. And even in Boston, it was more of a free and liberal city throughout American history. But even there, there was a lot of racism and not a lot of opportunity for her. She sought an education anywhere she could find it, which was mostly through Sunday school classes and learning about the Bible. Women in those days were essentially barred from most of the education system. It wasn't available to them. Then in 1826, she married James W. Stewart. And James had served on three different warships in the War of 1812, so he's a veteran. And they developed a prosperous business. He outfitted whaling and fishing boats. So he had this experience and connections within the Navy from the war, and he used that to create this big business. And they were relatively well off and part of the black middle class in Boston. Wow. And James was a leader of the black community in Boston, and they became members of the vibrant free black community in Boston's Beacon Hill area. Wow, that, that kind of, I mean, that almost seems like uh, like an anomaly almost mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. at that time in the early 1800s. Yeah. Right. Just 
she's off to a, a pretty good start so far in the story for what was available at that point. That the fact that he had his own business, right? That he had the ability and the freedom to be able to make those connections, get the capital that he needed to get it started. And yeah, they were part of a little bubble of freedom and opportunity that they had carved out in Boston. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, they became friends with a minister named Thomas Paul, who had started one of the the first African American churches. And we've talked about this before. The African American churches started because white churches were racist and either explicitly forbid black people to come or segregated them for uh, different periods of history that sometimes they force them to sit in the balconies or force them to sit in segregated seating and they wouldn't give speaking opportunities or ministerial opportunities. And so black churches formed not because of a self-segregation, but because of a resistance to the racism that was in the white churches. And Thomas Paul formed one of the first African-American churches called African Baptist Church. So the church had a school for black children and was an early host of the New England Abolitionist Society. Yeah. And we've talked about this before. The, the churches, the black churches specifically throughout history, functioned as the institution that kind of made up for the lack of government support for the black community. So churches were schools later on they they were almost like courts alternative courts in the south when when justice was not available through the american court system they would mediate disputes within the black community churches were early f- places where unionization and labor organization and voting campaigns and all these things happened through the church because black people throughout American history were not allowed to have institutional power in other institutions. Yeah. And this is like one of the first ones. Yeah, this is one of the first churches, and we already see that forming. It was it was a place that it functioned as a school and as an abolitionist society. A lot of early black newspapers and black press came through churches. Early newspapers were started through this or that church because that was the institution that where power could be organized for good. And that's the forerunning of the civil rights movement. Every church, like black churches, were integral to the black community because that would be their only place to gather, you know, and express the freedom of worship, the freedom to exist as black people, the freedom to express, in a lot of ways, some of the traditions in Africa and we know that Africa was evangelized and there were African Christians. It was, it's mentioned like way more than any European country in the Bible. But anyway, but the fact that, you know, that demonstrative worship, there's a culture, there's a whole culture to the black worship experience. And you're singing resistance, you're singing freedom, you're gathering, you're serving your community, you're meeting needs because a lot of the African-American people, some of them are enslaved, some of them are maybe free and poor, some of them are bond service servants, there's all kinds of situations. Some people may have escaped uh, to freedom, to Boston. I mean, there's. It, it, can you imagine like, an African-American church and just all the needs that exist. And then fighting for freedom is just a part, like fighting for your right, right to exist is just a part, a part of, you know, that overflow of their worship. And so then you, you see this forerunning of what the black church was, how it was birthed and what it became throughout like various civil rights movements throughout history. Mm-hmm. And it's just really, it's really powerful. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. At some point I'd like to, to dive more into black church. I know we did a couple episodes on yeah. Southern Baptists and stuff, but. So through the African Baptist church an early abolitionist movement started to form. And one of the leaders there was David Walker, who was considered in those days to be radical. And we would look at his teachings now and not think of them as so radical, but in that day, they were very radical. So he basically compared the modern moment of his day to the American Revolution and said, if these, you know, white people in Boston... Uh, is, this, is David Walker white? No, no he's, he's black. black. Okay. And basically said, if these, you know, white revolutionaries in Boston thought that tea was a good enough reason for an armed revolution, how much more so the enslaved black community throughout America. 
Like how? How much more so are we justified to have a revolutionary resistance to slavery and oppression? Do you want and, a revolution? And how did that? How did that go? So that seems like a pretty- you'll you'll see how it went, but not well. That he faced ex- a lot of resistance. Yeah, and was labeled radical even among some people who wanted to end slavery would view him as radical. Hmm. A lot of people in those days wanted to phase out slavery. Even among the abolitionist community, there's division on that. So he was radical for his day, but I mean, for for our day and context, looking back, it's like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. What, 3% tax versus enslavement? A life, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and it's like, that is... Like, how can you say that the American Revolution was justified and not... The fight for freedom. The fight yeah, for freedom. Yeah, I almost wonder what people said. I what mean, their responses what they, were. What their actual... Maybe not their response, but what, what's their actual, like, thought process? Their of, arguments. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I would be interested in hearing... I mean, maybe I wouldn't really yeah. be, but... I mean, I think it just <laughs> rested on white supremacy and, like, right. well, it's different because we're white. I mean, that's right. what it would have boiled down yeah. to. Absolutely. And black people are... Savages is what, you know, what people thought, Mm -hmm. what they thought back then, and that justified it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would have maybe articulated it different ways, but that's kind of what it would have boiled down to. So Walker supported himself through his own small business. He also had a small business buying and selling used clothing. And remember that James Stewart, Maria's husband, uh, had this business outfitting boats, and so there was a natural economic relationship there. So Stuart and Walker started to work together and Stuart would buy Walker's clothes, his used clothes, and outfit sailors with those clothes. So they they entered into business kind of with this partnership. Yeah. They were church friends, they were fellow abolitionists, so they had all kinds of connections between their families and they became close. And David Walker then influenced Maria's thinking as she was this young married woman, developing her worldview, and she would later quote from Walker extensively. She remained more religious, more feminist, and less accepting of violence than Walker, but she was influenced a lot by his thinking. It's kind of interesting because like when you, when I hear you say like she was feminist, that nowadays, I don't know what people think when they think you're feminist, but back then it's like, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a little different now. It's like they, I mean, women couldn't, do anything. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, I don't know. It's they just, think of e- extreme liberalism. Right, and not like true. Yeah. Well, I don't want to like. In her context. I'm not like trying to get into a war with feminists. I'm just, it's just like when we think feminists now and back in early 1800s, it's, it's, it's like. It's too different, especially coming from the worldview of a black woman. Right. I don't think that black feminism has ever been propped up or uplifted on the world stage. It's mm-hmm. always been, you know, Susan B. B. Anthony and, you know, and Nim, you know. Yeah, the white feminist movement that excluded That excluded black women. Black women. So this is, yeah, mm-hmm. different. Yeah. But before we get into the feminism angle, I want to hit on one more thing of Walker's because it's, it's amusing to me. Walker was widely known for a book that he wrote that, I and mean, get the title of this book. And books in those days just had long titles. It's just a historical thing. Because people read. People <laughs> weren't weren't turned off by a long title. Right. So his title and was... And they didn't have pictures on the covers. Yep. Right. They didn't. Assuming. People read... Like reading and oratory was like a major art form mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because people talked and people read. Yep. And so his book was titled Walker's Appeal in Four Articles together with a preamble to the colored citizens of the world, but in particular and very expressly to those of the United States of America. <laughs> I love it. Right on the nose, yeah. Listen yeah. here. Which, getting into the later stages now of finishing a book for yes. this podcast, and we may have to be inspired by Walker when we come up with our title. Yes, let's call it like a full amazing black woman named Katina D. Stone Butler and her two white guy friends. Yeah. Talk mm-hmm. about black history. We'll I put like that, that. We'll put in the idea box. <laughs> yeah. Write us with your it has to be submissions have to be at least 30 words. Yeah, let's yeah, see yeah. If we, <laughs> so James Stewart, Maria's husband and boating business, he helped distribute Walker's book. By yeah. slipping copies into the clothes of black sailors, okay. wow. especially those who would be sailing south into the slave states. Mm. So, I mean, he undercover contraband, like getting this message spread throughout the south. 
And as you kind of hinted earlier, Brad, the reaction in the South was not positive. There were bounties put on his head Mm. as white slavers in the South were... They were already afraid of a slave uprising like it happened in in Haiti 30 years prior. And when Walker's book then started to come into the South, they were violently resistant. Yeah. This reminds me of when Ida B. Wells wrote that one letter Mm -hmm. under a pen name that people assumed was a man. And yeah. That sparked all that agitation. All that drama. And then... You know, just thinking about him, David Walker, hiding books in people's clothes, like the ways that Black people pursued freedom mm-hmm. and, and spreading the word of freedom, that, that they're thinking these are free people in Boston living a much better life than enslaved people in the South, and yet, you know, they're thinking about their brothers mm-hmm. and sisters who are enslaved in their sewing books and clothes. Yeah, well, and, and, just, and they're doing a majority nonviolently. Right. And they're just putting books in clothes. Like right. I mean, if you think about it. I mean, no, the obviously the outcome of what they're talking about is big change. But, Revolutionary. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean Yeah. But the they were doing it without any money. They're not selling books. They're slipping books that they're printing oh, right. for free at their own expense into these clothes. And they're doing it at risk to themselves. Like yep. the time investment to write the book, the cost to print it, which was higher back then. You know, books are a lot cheaper to print now. And then the fact that they're doing it at risk to themselves. They had these relatively comfortable lives in Boston's black middle class. And yet we're leveraging those for the good of people who were enslaved throughout the country. Yeah. But then in 1829, Maria's pastor, Thomas Paul, passed away. And just waves of tragedy followed as shortly thereafter, her husband, James, also perished. And Maria was so devastated by that that she never remarried. She was just married for that short period of time in this relatively comfortable life that seemed like it was moving this direction of fighting for freedom within this community, in this safe bubble in America. And she was initially left with a substantial inheritance, or at least it seemed like it, because her husband had that business. But the executors of his state were all white businessmen, and they cheated Maria out of all the money in James's will for her. And through two painful years of litigation, she lost it all. She was left with nothing and struggled with poverty for the rest of her life. That was very common mm-hmm. for women, period, during that time. Mm-hmm. Hey, it's Garen. And if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know that we like stories and want to empathize with the people who we're learning about. And a great way that you can really enter deeply into stories is through listening to audiobooks by Penguin Random House. They have intimate narratives that are typically read by the author themselves. So you can empathize directly with the person who wrote the story. I'm excited to check out the memoir from Jennifer Grey, the iconic actress of Dirty Dancing. That was her breakout film. She went on to be in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And in her book, Out of the Corner, she tells the story of making it in Hollywood. And I'm most excited to check out Why Didn't You Tell Me by the former national television host, Carmen Rita Wong. It's a story about her discovery of her immigrant mother's long-held secrets and how they changed her understanding of her family, her identity, and her place in the world. So again, check out Why Didn't You Tell Me or Out of the Corner to get that deep perspective. Discover more memoirs to dive into from Penguin Random House Audio by visiting penguinrandomhouseaudio.com. As she was going through all of that, in the same period, David Walker also died mysteriously. And it was likely the result of a bounty on his head Man. because of his book. So all three of her coverings, because as a woman, you had to have that male covering. I don't know what other word to use, especially during that time. Mm-hmm. And so she lost her pastor, she lost her husband, and she lost a dear friend to her family. Mm-hmm. All, so her, 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 her covering was completely removed and left her exposed and vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how should we expect someone like Maria to respond? Having lost all of these, her deepest connections in the span of a year, losing her livelihood, her friend, her close associates, 
they've been murdered for this bounty that now also kind of hangs out of her, uh, hangs over her because of her connection with him. She was probably not super safe. She did the very opposite of what I would expect someone to do in that situation. She pressed on rather than run from God in anger. She ran to him for comfort. She found an unbelievable resolve to double down on her own activism. And now she had nothing to lose. She deepened her religious faith along with her agitation and work against racism and segregation. And she began to speak out publicly. Wow. So in those days, we don't realize how revolutionary it was for a woman to speak out publicly in those days because we don't live in that context. But America was incredibly sexist in 1831. In those days, women had very little power or position in public. They couldn't vote. They couldn't hold most jobs. They were not financially independent of their husbands. They couldn't have their own bank accounts. Right. Like They relied on men to provide for them and do the things for them because they legally couldn't have that status to function in society. And they couldn't speak publicly. Yeah. Uh, historian Barbara Welter describes that women of that time were supposed to focus exclusively on domestic matters and truly womanly women were expected to be too pious, pure, and submissive to male authority to want to venture outside that realm. I roll. But Maria ventured outside that realm. And in 1831, she delivered a manuscript to the offices of the white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison's startup newspaper, The Liberator. And she thus began to blaze a trail towards having a public voice, which for women was revolutionary in that day. So that, that summer, she published her essay, which it was another, not quite as much, but also a little bit of a doozy title, Religion and the Pure Principles of Morality, the Sure Foundation on Which We Must Build. And I want to just kind of dig in through some excerpts of this first paper that she published and just kind of enter into that moment and enter into kind of hear from her. That I mean, let's listen to this sister speaking to us from... How old is she? 200 years point? ago. I mean, at this point... 31. She's in her 30s. And she was born in 1803, right? She was about, what, 28 maybe. We'll say 28. Yeah. Excerpt 1, Dignity. Many thanks because your skins are tinged with a sable hue that you are an inferior race of beings, but God does not consider you as such. He hath formed and fashioned you in his own glorious image and hath bestowed upon you reason and strong powers of intellect. He hath made you to have dominion. He has crowned you with glory and honor. And according to the constitution of these United States, he has made all men free and equal. So this was written into a context that believed the opposite. They totally devalued black life and freedom. They had this blind spot where they didn't view the Constitution as applying to black people, which, I mean, is an utter contradiction. All over the country, there were efforts in those days to take even free blacks and send them back to Africa to colonize Liberia because they didn't want free black people living in America. Even, even many of the abolitionists yeah. um, sought to remove black people from America. Yeah. In several states, including our state of Texas, they barred free black people from even entering or living in the state. Like there wasn't a category for a free black person. Northerners did not want slavery, but they also didn't want free black men and women living with them. And into that atmosphere, Maria here argues from the Bible, which had all this cultural relevance and authority in those days in particular, that black people had, they were image bearers of God, having all the dignity of humans, which in those days was not seen or accepted. Okay, excerpt two, education. I am sensible, my brethren and friends, that many of you have been deprived of advantages, kept in utter ignorance, and that your minds are now darkened. And if any of you have attempted to aspire after high and noble enterprises, you have met with so much opposition that your souls have become discouraged. For this very cause, a few of us have ventured to expose our lives in your behalf to plead your cause against the great, and it will be of no use unless you feel for yourselves and your little ones and exhibit the spirits of men. Oh, then, 
Turn your attention to knowledge and improvement, for knowledge is power. Excerpt three, agency. It is of no use for us to sit with our hands folded, hanging our heads like bulrushes, lamenting our wretched condition. But let us make a mighty effort and arise. And if no one will promote or respect us, let us promote and respect ourselves. Okay. Excerpt four, prophetic zeal. Oh, America, America, foul and indelible is your stain. Dark and dismal is the cloud that hangs over you for your cruel wrongs and injuries to the fallen sons of Africa. The blood of her murdered ones cries to heaven for vengeance against you. You are almost become drunken with the blood of her slain. You have enriched thyself through her toils and labors, and now you refuse to even make a small return. And you have caused the daughters of Africa to commit whoredoms and fornications, but upon you be their curse. Wow. Excerpt five. We reclaim our rights. We will not come out against you with swords and staves as against a thief, but we will tell you that our souls are fired with the same love of liberty and independence with which your souls are fired. We will tell you that too much of your blood flows in our veins. We will tell you that... It is our gold that clothes you in fine linen and purple. It is the blood of our fathers and the tears of our brethren that have enriched your souls, and we claim our rights. Dang. Mic drop. Mm -hmm. I love the line where she says, if no one will promote or respect us, let us promote and respect ourselves. Ourselves, yeah. And, And in that context, no one would. And in that space, she's saying, she's uplifting the black community and challenging them to arise and take up for themselves the dignity that they were entitled to as children of God, if not respected by the constitution or by the country, that they could claim that inherent value and dignity that belonged to them from God. And she was bold and powerful in that message. Yeah. So the success of this piece in The Liberator led to a short but significant public speaking career for Stuart. She gave four recorded public lectures between 1831 and 1833. And accounts of these were then published in The Liberator, which amplified the message. And these are, like, she is known to history as the first American woman to speak publicly. Wow. And this gets back at how sexist society was back then. I mean, this is 1830s and there's not an earlier attested instance of women speaking publicly. So she, this was like a bold first step. And this is happening in Boston, which was kind of like the vanguard city for um, the liberalization of the culture. So I guess the, the location is not surprising, but it's surprising it didn't happen sooner because in our context, we just take for granted the equality of women. And that was not a given in those days. Now, Maria's first speech was to a female audience, audience which was a little bit you know less revolutionary. But her second, which had a much shorter title, just lecture delivered at Franklin Hall, was to a gender mixed audience. And that was where things really got a little crazy. Yeah. Uh, So this was, like I said, the first recorded instance of a woman speaking publicly, and she got a lot of backlash. It was extremely rare for women to give public addresses in those days, especially in front of what they called a promiscuous audience, as they Mm -hmm. referred to audiences that had both men and women. And many people considered it improper or even immoral for Maria to speak publicly. So daring to do so, Stuart embodied the equality that she called for in her speeches. Like she was part of her own message. Mm. She staked a claim for black women as leaders in the movement to resist oppression, both along racial and gender lines. But she would not be silenced. And so now 200 years later, we get to benefit from her unquieted voice. So let's spend a minute again, hearing from her through these excerpts of her speeches. So, um, I'm going to read some excerpts from speeches that Maria did at the African Mason Hall in 1832 and 1833. So on on the subject of opportunity will benefit all, she says, most of our color have been taught to stand in fear of the white man from their earliest infancy to work as soon as they could walk and call master, before they scarce could lisp the name of mother. 
but give the man of color an equal opportunity with the white from the cradle to manhood and from manhood to the grave. And you would discover the dignified statesman, the man of science and the philosopher, but there is no such opportunity for the sons of Africa. And I fear that our powerful ones are fully determined that there never shall be. On the subject of systemic injustice, she says, like King Solomon, who put neither nail nor hammer to the temple, yet received the praise, so also have the white Americans gained themselves a name, like the names of the great men that are in the earth, whilst in reality, we have been their principal foundation and support. We have pursued the shadow. They have obtained the substance. We have performed the labor. They have received the profits. We have planted the vines and they have eaten the fruits of them. On the subject of colonizationist efforts to deport free blacks to Liberia, if the colonizationists are real friends to Africa, let them expend the money which they collect in erecting a college to educate her inured sons in this land of gospel light and liberty. For it would be most thankfully received on our part and convince us of the truth of their professions and save time expense, and anxiety. So she did a speech called Why Sit Ye Here and Die? And on the subject of one of education, she says, Methinks there are no chains so galling as the chains of ignorance, no fetters so binding as those that bind the soul and exclude it from the vast field of useful and scientific knowledge. Oh, had I received the advantages of early education, my ideas would, ere now, have expanded far and wide. But alas, I possess nothing but moral capability, no teachings but the teachings of the Holy Spirit. On the subject of secondary racism, she says, I have asked several individuals of my sex who transact business for themselves if providing our girls were to give them the most satisfactory references, they would not be willing to grant them an equal opportunity with others. Their reply has been, for their own part, they had no objection. But as it was not the custom, were they to take them into their employ, they would be in danger of losing the public patronage. On argument against racial stereotypes, she says, I observed a piece in The Liberator a few months since, stating that the colonizationist had published a work respecting us, asserting that we were lazy and idle. I confute them on that point. Take us generally as a people, we are neither lazy nor idle. And considering how little we have to excite or stimulate us, I am almost astonished that there are so many industrious and ambitious ones to be found. Although I acknowledge with extreme sorrow that there are some who never were and never will be serviceable to society. And have you not a similar class among yourselves? On racial bias in employment, she says, Few, if any, have an opportunity of becoming rich and independent. And the employments we most pursue are as unprofitable to us as the spider's web or the floating bubbles that vanish into air. As servants, we are respected. But let us presume to aspire any higher our employer regards us no longer. Owing to the disadvantages under which we labor, there are many flowers among us that are born to bloom unseen and waste their fragrance on the desert air. So racist and sexist pressure against Maria continued to build until she decided it was time to move on. So in 1834, Stuart left Boston and moved to New York, where she joined a Black female literary society and began teaching. And she really, from that point, invested her life in teaching. She saw it as being just this undervalued vehicle for changing the future. And she taught hundreds, if not thousands, of children over the course of the next 20 years. Wow. And I just want to pause and reflect on those hundreds or thousands of children that she poured her life into for that next phase of the next 20 years of her life went on to influence the world and to teach others and to have families and teach their children and... I mean, think of the seeds planted 200 years ago through Maria 
and what the, how different the world is now because of those seeds that she planted, yeah. um, teaching and training a, a whole generation of the black youth in New York at that time. She just made this powerful investment. That I think we don't even have a way to measure or appreciate how different the world is because of her zeal to give children an opportunity better than what she was afforded. She relocated again 18 years later in 1852 to Baltimore in pursuit of better opportunities to make a difference as a teacher. And then she fled to Washington, D.C. to avoid the Civil War as fighting was drawing near to Baltimore. And in Washington, she was appointed as matron of the Freedmen's Hospital. Wow. In 1878, after a lifetime struggling with poverty... A new law was passed that made Stewart eligible to collect a pension for her former husband's military service all the way back in the War of 1812. And she used that money not to live lavishly for that last period of her life, but rather to publish her speeches and writings in hopes to continue to grow the impact of her life. And she died on December 17th, 1879 in Washington, D.C. at the Freedmen's Hospital. Maria influenced contemporaries such as Sojourner Truth. She was a big influence on Sojourner, who we have an episode on, if you want to go back and listen to that. Frederick Douglass, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. She was a front runner to European feminist activists who began speaking publicly shortly after her, also in Boston. And these were women who came over after having read The Liberator and seeing that Maria was had this public persona that was in Boston. And so then they came to Boston and kind of picked up that baton and ran with it and began to build the feminist movement. She was also the first Black American woman to write and publish political writings. Her calls for Black people to resist slavery, oppression, and exploitation were radical for their time, but they were radically true. They were radical only insofar as society was radically opposed to them. And then Maria, in pushing against it, knocked over some very important dominoes that started to fall forward through history and make changes. She spent her entire lifetime following her passion to educate Black youths, and we cannot even calculate how much of a difference that's made in the present. We'll end this episode by reading this excerpt regarding the subject of advancement through education. Maria says, perhaps you will say that you cannot send your children to high schools and academies, but you can have them taught in the first rudiments of useful knowledge, and then you can have private teachers who will instruct them in the higher branches, and their intelligence will become greater than ours, and their children will attain to higher advantages, and their children still higher. And then, though we are dead, our work shall live. Though we are moldering, Our names shall not be forgotten. Maria Stewart, the true founding mother of the feminist movement. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you are looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast, you can support us on Patreon for $5 a month. Just go to patreon.com backslash blackhistoryforwhitepeople. Like Garen said in the beginning of the episode, we do have a book coming out very soon, so just keep your eyes open for that. We're really excited to share the book with all of our listeners. We'll leave you with this quote from Maria Stewart herself. Talk without effort is nothing. <laughs>